Welcome, welcome, welcome to episode two of Moby Dick Abridged, or who cares what Eli thinks about Moby Dick. In this episode, we'll be covering chapter two of Moby Dick, The Carpet Bag. I, as always, am your host, Eli, who cares what I think, and I'm excited about this chapter because it's when the actual story sort of really gets going uh, somewhere. It's, it's shorter than the previous chapter, which had a whole six pages covered a uh, nearly 30 minute video. The carpet bag here tips the scales at a respectable four pages. Interestingly enough, several of the chapters in this book are actually quite short in terms of page count, but most of them are incredibly dense. The average length is just over five pages, but that includes only 15 out of 135 chapters of 10 pages or more. The longest chapter is 21 pages. The shortest is one page, uh, of which there are several. Next episode, chapter three, is one of the longer chapters. It's 15 pages long. So we'll look forward to a good long video next time. But for now, we got a pretty straightforward, pretty short one. So let's quit lollygagging and get right into it. I stuffed a shirt or two into my old carpet bag, tucked it under my arm, and started for Cape Horn in the Pacific. That's how the plot proper of Moby Dick really starts. In the last chapter, we learned what motivated Ishmael to go on the adventures he's unfolding to us, and in this one, he starts the adventure. He leaves Manhattan and arrives in New Bedford, which is a city in Massachusetts, on a Saturday night in December. He wishes, however, that he had made it in time to catch a boat for Nantucket, which he will instead have to wait until Monday for the next one. And all he has in his bag is fucking two shirts and whatever he's wearing now. Doesn't seem like very much to pack for a trip where he planned to circumnavigate the fucking planet, but, you know, whatever. Uh, I guess that's all he feels like he needs. Anyway, uh, next we get sort of a little history lesson about whaling. Ishmael tells us that while most people who want to go a whaling, as it were, uh, make their way to New Bedford these days and from there embark on their voyage. But he ain't about that. See, New Bedford has only recently sort of become the like the mecca, the hub of American whaling. But Nantucket was the original. So that's kind of why I like hesitated to say the mecca. I don't know how that like applies, but it's, it's definitely like the new center of American whaling. But Nantucket was the original, right? And something about the uh and something about Nantucket being the original uh like appeals to Ishmael. He tells us that Nantucket is where the first dead American whale was stranded, which, you know, to me seems about as dubious of a claim as if I told you I know how many trees there are on Earth. But I don't know. Let's just go along for the ride, because after all, I think we discussed this a little bit, uh, to put it outrageously generously in episode zero, about how Melville is like sort of establishing a mythology, so to speak, about the whaling industry uh, in Moby Dick with the book Moby Dick. And I think that's why he'd make a claim sort of like this, which is like sort of absurd in its unverifiability. But he then follows it up by claiming sort of equally dubiously that it was from Nantucket that pre-Columbian native sallied forth in canoes to hunt the Leviathan. I mean, I'm not saying that that's like not true. I'm just saying like, what is he, how does he know that? Was he there? I don't know. That's just like a legend, a whaling legend that he's like incorporating into this mythology that he's building. And I'm sort of like reminded of a little bit from Dave Chappelle's uh, 2004 standup special for what it's worth. Um, the special was taped at a famous club uh, in San Francisco called the Fillmore. And at the very beginning of the uh, special, you know, while it's like uh, the part where it's not the comedy and it's always like got like something he's like talking at that part. And it's like uh, about he's talking about why he wants to do the special in San Francisco. And he says, because Lenny Bruce ripped it up. And so Dave Chappelle wanted to perform in the place where the greats performed. He's like, I'm great. I want to perform where the greats performed. And that's why Ishmael wants to set out from Nantucket in like the traditional way instead of the fucking nouveau riche way of New Bedford. I mean, fucking New Bedford has the word new in the fucking name, man. That's no good. That's no good for this. 
So anyway, he's like a little bummed that he can't make it to Nantucket for like sentimental reasons. But also he realizes that he's got to find somewhere to sleep and eat in New Bedford and pay for it. So he finds out that he missed the boat. And he's like, fuck. And then he realizes that he's got nowhere to stay. And he's like, double fuck. And then he reaches in his pocket nervously and he's like, strike three, fuck me. Because all he pulls out is a couple of silvers. So he decides that he can't afford to be too choosy about where he's going to stay. Because he really can't afford much of anything at all. And he sets off through the unfamiliar streets. The mean streets of 1850s New Bedford. That, good lord, the mind recoils. But not for long, because we're about to go there right now. So he walks all over town. He passes some place called the Crossed Harpoons, but it looks too nice and expensive, so he doesn't want to go in. He doesn't even bother stopping. He thinks about stopping at the Swordfish Inn, but decides that it, too, is too expensive and nice looking, so he keeps on walking. And so he walks and he walks and he fucking walks all over this motherfucker. And he's like, fuck, does anybody even live out here? What the fuck, dude? This part of town. And he's like, oh, it's all like deserted and shit. There's like no streetlights. Not that there would be like electric streetlights or anything, but there's nothing. There's just no, there's fucking nothing out there. There's no lights. There's no houses out there. It's all fucking dark and shit. But finally, after he's like starting to worry a little bit, he's just like getting freaked out. Uh, he finds a building uh, with lights on and the door is open and you know he decides maybe sort of in his desperation maybe maybe he's being sensible i don't know i didn't see the fucking building he did if if Ishmael's even his real name anyway uh he decides that it kind of looks like sort of a public building so he walks in and he finds out it's like a black church it's like uh the congregation is all black and the preacher is black and he's talking the preacher's sermon is about the blackness of darkness, which actually sounds like pretty cool. I kind of want to hear that sermon, but we don't get to <clears throat> because uh, he doesn't give us any further context about it because he just leaves um, because, you know, in fairness, he still has to figure out the whole food and shelter situation. But, you know, I, I can't help but wondering if uh, we're supposed to like associate that phrase, the blackness of darkness with something later in the book, the whiteness of the whale. I don't know. I feel like uh, I feel like it's kind of begging me, pleading with me, if you will, to uh, find some sort of relation. But, you know, outside the whole like uh, values, you know, black and white thing, uh, we don't get a whole lot, you know, because, again, he just fucking bounces. Like, but at the same time, why the fuck else would you even put it in the book if we're not supposed to, like, make something of it, right? Because he just fucking walks in and dips like fucking Grandpa Simpson taking his hat and coat back and leaving the brothel when he sees fucking Bart working at the door. Look it up. If you don't know what I'm talking about. But honestly, I don't I don't know. It seems like just too perfect for it to not mean something. I don't know. Let me know what you think about that in the comments. Anyway. He leaves. And by the way, um, he calls that place the trap. I'm not sure if they ever, if I just missed it, if I just never noticed. I don't know if there's like a sign saying that it's called the trap or he just calls it the trap. That seems like a fucking weird name for a church. Who the fuck knows? Anyway. At last, he, he leaves the trap. Whatever. And, uh, he comes to a place with a sign that reads the spouter in Peter coffin. And he thinks coffin spouter spouter. I hardly know her. Pause for applause and, and raucous laughter. It doesn't say spouter. I hardly know her in the book. No, that, that I made that up anyway. Um, he thinks coffin spouter that seems ominous and you know remember that shit because i now actually not now because i the i that wrote the script for this after rereading this was like damn fucking dropped it that early damn 
that's wild. Okay, so fucking bear this in mind. Remember all the way back in chapter two, you're getting shit like this. Anyway, he examines the exterior and he's like, you know, this looks like a little pretty shabby, you know, a little moth eaten, so to speak. If moths could eat buildings and God damn, that's fucking terrifying. Um, <clears throat> wish I had thought of a different <sighs> phrase. Anyway, he decides that the, uh, the spouter in looks shitty enough <laughs> that he might be able to afford a bed. So he's willing to overlook the whole coffin situation and try his luck. And after all, it's really goddamn fucking cold in New Bedford, Massachusetts on a Saturday night in December, you know? And he goes on and on and fucking on about the cold with this crazy allusion to the biblical story of St. Paul's shipwreck. And he name drops the wind that wrecked the ship because I guess the wind has a fucking name. It's Eurachlodon. Just in case. Just in case. Just in. Just in case. Just in case you wanted to know. It's it's Eurachlodon. He says it five times in one paragraph. And he talks about uh, Lazarus and being dead, sort of. I don't know. It's one of the stranger metaphors in the book, to be honest. But he really, really wishes he was warm. And he's not going to be... Unless he goes inside the spouter in. And then, after all that crazy shit about Eurachlodon, he wraps up the chapter with this fucking silly little gem of a closer. He's like, but no more of this blubbering for now. We are going a whaling, and there is plenty of that yet to come. Let us scrape the ice from our frosted feet and see what sort of place this spouter may be. That's right. He made a fucking whale pun at the end of this chapter, and so did I. <laughs> get it like a right whale fucking abysmal anyway thank you so so much for watching i hope you will join me next time dear viewer for chapter three the spouter in